One thing is certain. If you stick to the word, you will come back with a testimony. What God wants to give you in your life is not a healing. What God wants to give you in your life is not a job. What God wants to give you in your life is not money. What God wants to give you is the word of God in your spirit. It will make you what it talks about. And you are shining. And you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are shining and nothing can stop you. It is your season. It is your time. Nothing can hinder you. This is your time. This is your hour. Favor is yours. Life is spiritual, having its principles and modes of operation, but many are ignorant of this truth. We can understand spiritual principles. There are things that we will know by virtue of the ministrations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In this enthralling series on spiritual warfare by Pastor Chris, get ready to be transformed by the right information from God's Word that will set you ahead and give you a deeper revelation. Those who are into spiritual warfare sometimes are over into it and their whole life is full of war. Then you have the other extreme that says there's nothing like that. And they are also a mess. Am I saying stay at the middle? No, stay on the word. That's what I'm saying. What does the Bible say? Listen and be blessed. You know, if you've never been engaged in certain kinds of um, spiritual conflicts, you may not know these kind of things. It depends on how you were raised, you know? And your training matters. If you've not been trained for war, you'll not be sent to war. Before God brought David to fight Goliath, David had dealt with a lion and a bear. He didn't just bring some young guy from somewhere who had no knowledge of this. Saul was afraid of Goliath even though he was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. But he was afraid of Goliath. How come David, a young man, was not afraid of Goliath? Because God had trained him. So if you've not been trained for these kind of things, you'll be there saying, well, I don't believe there's any spiritual warfare. I don't believe. You don't believe what the Bible says? Something's wrong. There are different strategies for different places. For example, um, it wasn't in every situation that Daniel had a visitation that the, the, the angel was detained or even um, uh, had any conflict in the heavenlies. It wasn't in every situation. He had the angelic visitation several times. It was only once that we are reported, or it's reported, that the angel was withstood by some evil forces. Let's read from the Bible. Daniel chapter 8. Let's read from verse 15. At this point, he had an angelic visitation. Let's see what happened here. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, he had seen a vision and wanted the interpretation of the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. Suddenly an angel of God appeared to him. Now this angel didn't say I had war in heaven. No. Next verse. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So that angel was called Gabriel. Next verse. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Says this vision is for the end of time. Praise God. All right. Next verse. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. All right. Go to chapter 9 from verse 20. Same book of Daniel. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord... The Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Mm -hmm. 
Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. Now that's what we just read in chapter 8. Whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give this skill and understanding. At the beginning of that, look at this. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. When you began to pray, the commandment came forth. Right at the time you began to pray. I, you know, I want God's people to understand that when, we, when our knees hit the floor and we begin prayer, the answer is released. That's what happened to Daniel. It says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Look at that. He says, when you began praying, the commandment came forth, and here I am. He didn't say I was withheld. There was no delay. So it wasn't every time. You know, so so I, I don't want to have this idea that uh, every time we pray, uh, angels are withstood by devils. It's not all the time. It's not all the time. And, and, and that's why Jesus said, Jesus said to Peter in by extension to the church, he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. We can understand spiritual principles. There are things that we will know by virtue of the ministrations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When Jesus ministered to the sick, he didn't minister the same way to every sick person. Some sicknesses were caused by demons. Some were not caused by demons. So there were times that he cast out devils and the people were healed. Some other times he just touched them and they were healed. Because it wasn't every sickness that a demon was behind it. Are you following this? So, we don't just say... By the way, we need to realize that devils, demons, while they have a structure, they are of different categories, different levels. The hierarchy is clear. And there are, there are situations where you walk in and the demons just leave. You see it? Sometimes you start preaching the word of God and demons just go away. They don't make any noise. They just leave. Sometimes, some people who are possessed come to a church or a place where God's people are gathered and the demons wait outside until the close of the meeting. But there are others. Like when Jesus said to his disciples, when they came to him, they said, Master, why couldn't we cast this devil out? He said, first, because of your unbelief. Then he said, how be it? This kind doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. He said, how be it this kind? Jesus knew this kind. Why didn't they know? They didn't have the revelation. You have to know by the Spirit. Just like we said yesterday, David didn't know that he was moved of Satan to number Israel. Those prophets of Ahab didn't know that a lying spirit had put other demons into the mouths of all, all, the, all the prophets. They didn't know. They were just talking. Or they were lying. They didn't know. When Peter was talking to Jesus and saying, Master, don't talk about dying. You're not going to die. It's never going to happen to you. He didn't realize it was the devil that was talking through him. But Jesus was clear. The Bible says he turned to Peter and said, Get thee hand, Satan. That didn't mean that Peter had become Satan. And Jesus also knew when Satan left. Because he addressed him and afterwards continued other discussions. Which means the devil obeyed Jesus. You still there? So we're not given the idea that um, uh, every time you've got to make some war. No. I said sometimes like... In some places you read in the Bible, Jesus was preaching. The demons didn't manifest themselves. But all men, the Bible says, sought to touch him. For they went virtue out of him and healed their sick. And those that had evil spirits were healed. On other occasions, while he was still preaching, the demons were screaming and crying. Shouting. What are we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Screaming. 
Hallelujah. But you know, the, the, the problem in the church about these kind of things, why there are those who say there's spiritual warfare, others that there is none, is because there are two extremes. Those who are into spiritual warfare sometimes are over into it and they, their whole life is full of war. <laughs> Everything is war. Then you have the other extreme that says there's nothing like that. And they are also a mess. Am I saying stay at the middle? No. Stay on the word. That's what I'm saying. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Hallelujah. Okay. Let's, let's move on, right? <laughs> now, Daniel didn't have what we have today. <laughs> Imagine this. He was praying. He knew nothing about what was happening in the heavenlies. Even if he knew, he couldn't have done anything about it. Even if he knew. He would have just been watching cinema. And wow, look at what's happening. He couldn't have done anything about it. Because at that time, Satan still had the authority that he had. Until he was defeated by Jesus. Now, let's see something that's written for us in the book of Jude. Jude and verse number 9. Some of your devices will say Jude chapter 1 verse 9, okay? It says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Now, can you imagine? We come to find what happened in the New Testament. This wasn't reported like that in the old. But now we know what happened. But that's not the point, just getting your attention on that. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him, against Satan, a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Now, the Bible shows us that when Moses died, he says, God buried him. Now, we know that... The, the angel came to take him away. The angel came to take him away. So Moses never went to hell. As others did. Now you remember, there was a part of hell where the righteous went to. Hades, maybe you call it. But um, until Jesus came and liberated them. Okay? But Moses never went there. Because we find him on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah. See? So proof, he never went there. This was what happened. Michael, the archangel, went for him. But when he got there, the devil wanted him. Why? Because he had a right over everyone who died in this world until Jesus came. Satan had a right. And that's why they were taken to Hades. So the best they could enjoy was Abraham's bosom. On the other side of hell. Where was a great gulf separating that place from the place of torment. That Jesus talked about when he discussed Lazarus and the rich man. You remember the story? So, Moses is dead. Satan comes. And... Michael is here also. But Satan had been higher than Michael. But he's a fallen angel. So what does Michael do? He says, the Lord rebuke you. So he spoke to Satan in the name of the Lord. And Satan let him go. So I want you to mark that. Michael rebuked Satan in the name of the Lord. Okay. Now let's go to a very simple thing. This is the area we've been dealing with, all right? Matthew chapter 16. 
Read from verse 19. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. It, Jesus said this, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, remember, I told you yesterday that there's another portion of the Bible, the 18th chapter, and from the 18th verse, where he says about the same thing. But I said, if you say the same thing in different places, the meaning may be the same or not the same. It will depend on the context. From the context, it was clear that what he said, when he said these same things in the 18th chapter, he wasn't referring to the same thing in the 16th chapter. Because the context were totally different. Now, I understand very clearly where some theologians come from when they talk about the Hebrew understanding of what Jesus was saying, but the, the rabbinical understanding of binding and losing. But that's rubbish. Because Jesus wasn't talking to the rabbis. All right? He's talking to his disciples. And he's talking to disciples about spiritual power. All right? And so what you still need is the context. The context had nothing to do with validating or invalidating scriptures. That's not what he was talking about. Again, we need to understand the very words used. Let me start from the beginning. The first and important one there, I'll give unto the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And I understand when keys stand for authority. In this case, they don't stand for authority. They don't stand for authority. They stand for understanding of principles, mysteries. It's like saying um, five keys for church growth. You see it? If I were teaching on five keys for church growth, and I began to give you keys, that's what Jesus is talking about. Give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about mysteries, understanding mysteries. There are things in the kingdom he's going to reveal to his disciples, and they'll be able to use those things to live the kind of victorious life that he's given to them. So here in this scripture, keys don't stand for authority. One of the, one of the scriptures that uh, some theologians refer to is where he says um, in Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22, where it talks about the key of David, the key of the house of David. They don't relate. They're not the same. Because in that case, he was talking about you shut the door and no man can open it, and you open the door and no man can shut it. Jesus still has that key. He says, I put before you an open door, which no man can shut. That's a totally different thing. See, the, the, the um, use of language... As important as it is, should not stop us from reading beyond and understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of God. There are more than enough examples. Maybe I should take the next one first so we can deal with this. The next thing, where he says, same verse, whatsoever... Thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. So, what does it mean to bind? I think that that's where, the, that's where the issue is. When it says, whatsoever thou shalt bind, what does it mean to bind? Firstly, the Greek word translated dio is bind. It means to bind as in chains. All right? It also means to put on that obligation. It means to prohibit. It means to prevent free movement or liberty. So here is where the problem really lies for a lot of people. Because they see that word 
as all by itself, without its synonyms, without its clearer, expanded understanding. Or they want to see it in its limited form. And the limited form is when you say, forbid. Whatever you, forbid. That's in its most limited form. Interestingly, in most of the scriptures, where that same word is used, almost every time, it means to hinder, to put on the obligation, to prevent liberty, to bind as in chains. It almost has nothing to do with permission or lack of it. So that's the most limited definition of the word when you say to uh, forbid or not permit. Are you following what I'm sharing with you? So in spite of the reality of those things, we really need to understand where Jesus was going when he used this particular term in this particular portion. What was he saying? Now, let's look at um, these meanings that I gave you and consider a few portions. I said bind as in chains. Yesterday, we read from the Bible in the book of Revelation where he told us in the 20th chapter about Satan being bound, okay, by an angel who put him in the bottomless pit. And it does tell us that the angel came with chains. In the other portion, I believe in the ninth chapter, we also read how that there were uh, angels, fallen angels, that were bound in the river Euphrates. And the word came for them to be released, to be loosed. That doesn't sound like mere permission in forbidding. Sounds more to me like someone's liberty was taken away. They were under obligation to be in a certain place. Okay. Uh, uh, they were bound, possibly with chains, right? Yeah, that's what the Bible shows us. Then in the 13th chapters in Luke's gospel, we find a woman who was bowed over, all right? And she comes in while Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And Jesus said, ought not this woman being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound these 18 years, be loosed from her infirmity? And he caused her to straighten up when he touched her. And he said, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he said, Satan bound her. And when Satan bound her, what happened? She could not straighten herself. She could not. Because Satan bound her. Hallelujah. So the problem is in the use of the word. When Jesus said, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. It's like saying, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Now, when Christians go, I bind you, here is where the problem lies. It's like saying, Father, I ask you. It's not clear. You haven't said anything. I just told you to bind means several things. Communication must be understood. What does the devil understand by what you said? And what do you understand by what you said? There must be a mutual understanding. For example, if I say I arrest you, or I say I appoint you, your reaction will be different, depending on what both of us understand by either one. If I say to you, I arrest you, you would want to know by what power or authority am I arresting you. On the other hand, if I say, I appoint you, you think I probably have something, you know, you want to know what I'm appointing you into. I remember years ago, a policeman stopped me 
I was coming from a meeting, Karen Castle player, just a teenager. And um, he said, stop there. Who owns this thing? I said, it's for my dad. He said, where's the receipt? <laughs> I didn't have any receipt. I said, uh, I don't have any receipt. You know, he was holding his gun. They were, it was at a checkpoint. Several other policemen were there. He says, stand there. You are arrested. <laughs> That's all he said to me. He said, stand there. You are arrested. And I stood there. I understood I was arrested. <laughs> I stood there. I couldn't move. I knew he didn't say you are appointed. <laughs> I understood clearly between both of us the meaning of you are arrested. I remained there. Do you understand this? So, the, when you say I bind you, what do you mean? Because it means different things. Which one do you mean? Oh, Father, I just ask you. I ask you, I ask you. Or if you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. So we go further and ask for something. I don't say, Father, I ask for anything in your name. Anything in your name. Hallelujah. Anything in your name, I ask. I ask for anything in your name. If you like cry, if you like laugh, you will not get anything. Why? Because though Jesus said, if you shall ask anything in my name, he expected you to decode that and use it. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth. Okay, first is what is it you want to bind? Two, what binding do you want to apply? If I say, Satan, out and return no more, I have bound him from coming back to this place. You see, I have forbidden him from coming back to this place. He cannot enter here again. Like Jesus said, come out of him and enter no more into him. Remember that young boy Jesus cast the devil out of? Are you following this? So what does your binding mean? Now suppose you say to me, can we bind the devil in such a way as to like have them in chains like those ones in the Euphrates? Well, first of all, I do not know that we, we need to determine where they go. But I know that it is possible to issue such a decree. You say, how do you know? I'll show you some things in the Bible in a moment. But Demons, uh, devils of different levels. And they're also intelligent beings. Can we bind Satan himself as a person? As at now, it's illegal. Because the Bible tells us when he's going to be bound. So he is not going to be bound now. The only way you bind Satan now is by dealing with him as an institution. Are you following this? Mm. Got to show you something here. I want you to go to Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. I want you to notice something. It says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought Satan was already bruised under our feet. So how can, how can Paul tell us that the Lord will bruise Satan under our feet shortly? Why? He's not dealing with Satan as a person. He's dealing with Satan here as an institution. Now, let me explain further. 
You can't, you can't see that immediately here until you go to verses before. So you ready? Okay. Now let's start reading from verse 17. Same book, same chapter. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have learned and avoid them. Okay? People who cause divisions in the house of God. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Mm -hmm. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. You see it? He's looking at Satan as the the overall responsible for all of those things he talked about. The divisions in the churches, the problems, all the evil work going on that he's talking to them about. And he says, don't worry, the Lord will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That Satan there is not talking about Lucifer, the person. He's dealing with Satan and his structure. Satan as an institution of evil. Can you see that? That's what he's talking about. Glory to God. So, if if, if Daniel lived in our dispensation and understood spiritual realities, he could have bound, as it were, that prince of Persia. If he knew about it, he could have taken action. You say, really? Yes. 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 See, um, those who think that we don't have the power to bind devils are mistaken. They're grossly mistaken. I'll tell you why. It's even annoying to think that anybody who believes he's a Christian would consider that. Why do I say that? Do you know the name of Jesus? Do you know the power of the name of Jesus? Do you understand what that represents? I think those people have forgotten what the Bible says about Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know what his name represents? Just because your prayers are not being answered, doesn't mean other people's prayers are not being answered. (laughs) Yeah, because, you know, there are people, they've tried many things that didn't work, so they come out and say it doesn't work. you know who Jesus is? Okay, just for the records, 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's read from verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Elijah and his servant. You know? The young man woke up early in the morning and found that the whole place had been surrounded. They're looking for Elijah. They want to arrest Elijah. Verse 16. And he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Okay. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. Hey. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. He didn't say they that be with us are more than them. He saw horses. He saw soldiers on horses and chariots. That's what the servant saw. And ran to the master and said, Master, what shall we do? We're surrounded. Elisha says, fear not. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. So he knows there's a spiritual warfare here. So these soldiers have those behind them. They're spiritual forces. Do you think they came to shake hands? Next verse. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Okay, did they come there? 
to greet him. They came for war. With who? The soldiers? No! The spiritual army behind those soldiers. And so what, what, do you, what kind of fight do you think it's going to be? We push me, I push you. <laughs> Some will be bound and taken prisoners. And they'll be put somewhere. For God knows how long. Didn't you hear in the last days, the ones that were put in <laughs> River Euphrates will be set free. They are still there. <laughs> they are still there. Since Genesis. <laughs> They are still there. They've not been brought out yet. All these many years, they've been in Euphrates River, in chains. If God didn't tell us about those ones, we wouldn't have known. There are others that have been bound in different places. I told you, there are very many. So when we say in the name of Jesus Christ, <laughs> angels are ready for the word. So what do you want? If we say, out and return no more, they will never come back there. Because they are angels making sure they never come back. Now, on the other hand, if I say, I bind you. Now, understand this. That language is what we say it is. If my understanding at the time of speaking is that I'm binding you. Meaning, being tied, as it were. Being bound as though with chains. Being retarded in such a way as to forbid your liberty henceforth. If that is what I mean at the time of speaking, the simple English word bind, then the angels will affect it. Because I'm speaking in the name of Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read from verse 13. But the witch of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? To minister for it means to serve them who shall be heirs of salvation. He's talking about us. How the angels serve us. The problem is, many don't know what the name of Jesus means. They don't know. Let's read, what, let's read just a little. Just, just a, I, I could spend a whole month teaching on the name of Jesus. But let's just go to Philippians chapter 2. Let's begin from verse 9. How, how dare anybody suggest that there's anything we cannot do in the name of Jesus? What you need is wisdom in the word of God. For example, I said it wouldn't make any sense for you to say that you are binding Satan himself, Lucifer. Why? Because there's an appointed time. I'll show that to you in the scripture in a moment. Now, he says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at, oh dear, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. What do you understand by the word bow? It means every knee is brought to submission at the name of Jesus. And then somebody tells me that I use the name of Jesus and the devil is not going to submit? Are you kidding? Didn't you read this? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. You say only in the earth. No, look at it. In heaven, in earth, and under the earth. That means hell. Hallelujah. But that's what Jesus said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So that you can have an understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. St. So Matthew chapter 13, let's read verse 11. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you 
to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So that understanding the, 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 the word of God and how the kingdom functions will know exactly what to do. For example, he gives us the gifts of the Spirit with which to minister. It's not every one of us who may have the gift of the discerning of spirits. And it doesn't mean that if you don't have the gift of discerning of spirits, that you cannot deal with evil spirits. After all, the gift of the discerning of spirits is not primarily for dealing with demons. It is not. Even though it could be useful in that regard. But the word of God doesn't say that's what it is primarily for. So whether or not you have it, you still can deal with them. But there are different levels. And so he can give you, he says, that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for the common good. He says to profit with all. Which means it's for our common profit. That means it's to our advantage. So those gifts help us in doing more. I can exhort you from the Word of God. But when I have the gift of prophecy in operation, it takes that exhortation to a higher level. You see it? Glory to God. So there are different strategies for different things. We shouldn't wait to say, okay, um, and, and, and be guessing. That's why praying in the Spirit is so important. Because, like I said, demons are not necessarily responsible for everything. So you don't have to wait until there is a, um, a manifestation of some devil, or we think, oh, maybe there's a, a devil in this place, that's why there's... It's not so. As you pray in the Spirit, He will guide you. Believe in the Holy Spirit. Believe in Him. He was sent to lead us and to guide us. He said He will guide you into all truths. Into all truths. So you don't have a problem. It's whether or not you're going to recognize Him in your life. If you recognize Him, He'll help you. Whether you're praying about the church, you're praying about a certain family, you're praying about a business, a job, a project. If you will pray in the Spirit, He will guide you. If you will walk in the Spirit, He will guide you. He will show you things to come. He will guide you into all truths. He said, He shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So there will be no place for confusion. So the different strategies in a, certain, in a certain place, I told you, maybe you've been praying about something. Consider, understand spiritual warfare. I wanted to have you first of all enlightened about these things. So that when the Holy Spirit is ministering to you, because, you know, if you have knowledge of the Word of God, then you can be led by the Spirit more easily for your life because it will be easy for you to accept whatever it tells you. If you don't know the word of God, even when God is talking to you, you'll be arguing with him because you're ignorant. But if you're knowledgeable in the word, it'll be simple. He wouldn't have to start proving things to you first. You just know because the word of God is in your spirit. See, you, you, you understand the word. So once he says this to you, instead of waiting to know whether is it true, is it not true, you just move. But if you don't know the word, you'll be doubting, you know, difficulty in following the Lord. So when you're praying about the church, and praying for members, there are things that he will show you. For example, in those, those years when we used to go to certain towns and villages to preach the gospel, there were times, it wasn't in every, every village, but when we prayed, there were times we were led specifically to the center of that village, to the square of that village, to pray in that place first. And then we took over that land. Some other times we were led to go to the, the traditional ruler of the place and minister to him. Did you know that in certain cases we went to an institution we were led by the Spirit to go to the foundation stone and lay hands on that foundation stone? We, we weren't asked to do this all the time because strategies are different. Those who don't understand the art of war they are the ones that don't think with strategies. They say there's no war because they have already lost. 
As you pray, the Holy Spirit will show you what to do. Sometimes you tell you say a word. And you put that word in your mouth and you say it. And that's it. Let's look at something in the Bible. Exodus. Book of Exodus. Chapter 17. I'm going to read from verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now I want you to notice something. He's used to this thing. He's used to the rod because God told him with this rod you're going to perform miracles. Okay? So in everything Moses uses the rod. So he says to Joshua, I want you to go and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I'll go to the top of the hill and I'll be with the rod of God in my hand. That's a symbol of victory. So you go and fight and I'll be up there. All right, next verse. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hor went up to the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand. Notice, this time it's not, it wasn't about the rod. When Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Uh-oh. It was an observation. It was an observation. Next verse. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone. See, they observed it. They took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hor stayed up his hands. The one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Next verse. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Let's look at something. He was about the hands being up. He wasn't the height of the hands. He was about his hands being up. So even though he sat down, they kept his hands up. Because they realized he was as long as his hands were up. There was victory for Israel. So what was God's strategy for victory over Amalek? It was Moses' hands being up. It wasn't Joshua's hands being up. It wasn't about Hor's hands being up. It wasn't Aaron's hands being up. It was Moses' hands being up. Notice that. And they discovered it. What is the strategy that God is giving? I told you. Even though... We have more weapons, more access to God's arsenal. We have authority. We are dealing with the same demons and devils that they dealt with. The difference is they have been defeated. And we are to execute the judgment written. He says, this honor have all his saints. Hallelujah. But they haven't stopped acting like they used to act. Hoping we'll never find out that they were thoroughly and totally defeated. They hope we don't know. But they're still there. That's what the Bible says. Resist the devil. James chapter 4 verse 7. He says, and he will flee from you. Resist. They couldn't do that. But how do you resist the devil? You resist the devil with the word of God. You resist the devil with the word of God. He says, above all. Take unto you what? The shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to neutralize all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, let's look at another. You've just seen this strategy. Let's see another one. Joshua chapter 5. We're reading from verse 13. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? Next verse. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was strictly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I want you to notice now. The Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given into thy hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. 
and you shall compass. Here's the strategy. You shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shall thou do six days. Mm-hmm. And seven priests shall be here before the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day, you shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. This was the strategy. He didn't say, lift your hands. Did you notice? He didn't say that. He said, go around the city six days, once every day. On the seventh day, you do it seven times. Then at the last time, he says, when you hear the blast of the horns, the trumpets by the priests, he says, shout, and the walls will fall down flat. <laughs> Hallelujah. What strategy? There's a time where God says, all you do is just praise. And you praising God, praising, no casting out of demons. You just be praising God and praising God and demons will check out. They'll just leave. All because you're praising God. Praising God. Just praising God. Paul and Silas, we remember. Remember that in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, what happened to Paul? He was in the street. And one lady kept disturbing him. Paul and his colleagues, these are the servants of God who teach us the way of God. These are the servants of God who teach us the way of God. The Bible says she did it for several days. Paul didn't say anything. Until this last day, the Bible says Paul was grieved in his spirit. All the time, there was peace. As long as both sides did nothing other than hear what the lady said, the demons were quiet. Paul was quiet. There was no trouble. But Paul was grieved now in his spirit. And the Bible says he turned to the girl and said to the devil, come out of her. And the devil went out. And the people who were using her for divination found out that the devil had gone out of her and they couldn't use her anymore. They were angry. And the Bible says they leaped upon Paul and Silas and beat them up. Until the police came <laughs> and arrested Paul and Silas on top of that and put them in prison. But in the night, they sang praises. Did you hear that? They were wearing the, the strategy of the Holy Ghost on this occasion was not, Thou devil in charge of this prison. Oh, you will open the gates today. We bind this devil. It wasn't. He says, let the high praises of God be in their mouths. So they use the high praises of God. The Bible says Paul and Silas sang praises unto God. In the night time, at midnight. And the prisoners heard them. And the Bible says there was an earthquake. In the prison. Doesn't say in the city. In the prison. There was an earthquake in the prison. And the bands were loosed. Was the power of losing not used there? It's binding and losing. All their, their bands were loosed. The doors were open. And Paul and Silas came out, and the, the jailer thought they had escaped. And he says, No, do yourself, do harm, because the man wanted to kill himself. Just for we are all here. And the man knew it was because these men were singing. And he said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And then he took them in, cleaned their wounds. He and his family got born again that night. And then in the morning they said, please hurry and leave. They said, we're not leaving. Paul said, we're not leaving. You beat us up publicly. You want to send us out privately? We're not going. He said, tell them to come and fetch us out by themselves. Because we are Romans and they mistreated us. They dealt with us illegally. Go and call them. <laughs> and the Bible says when the magistrate heard that Paul was a Roman, he became afraid. 
So they had to plead with him, please forgive us. Then he forgave them and left. Hallelujah. The message that you have just heard is a production of the Love World Media Ministry. For this and other messages by Pastor Chris, visit our Christ Embassy bookstores. Or better still, log on to our website at ChristEmbassyOnlineStore.org. And that's just a click away. God bless you.